Today in the room, along with myself, I have the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong. We have Andy Allen, Robin Newton and Sinead Innes also in the room. And on Starleaf, we have Fran McCann, Jonathan Buckley and Mark Durkin. Um, members, again, just to remind you that I'll bring you in whenever you want to speak and um, just give it a wee moment, a uh, pause before you start and put your hand up if you do want to speak. Um, next item is just if members have any declaration of interest, um, if they can let us know as we go through the items today. And then the first item on the agenda then will be apologies, and I have no apologies. And I'll move on then to agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. And just want to inform members that it's normal practice for committees to delegate authority to the chairperson and deputy chairperson during periods of recess. Um, to submit views on the releasing or withholding of information on any non-routine contentious FOI requests received. The committee would be, would, would be advised of any such requests and the views expressed by the chairperson and or the deputy chairperson and the response issued by the FOI unit um, at the first available meeting following the recess period. So I said this is normal practice. So I just want to ask members, are they content that we continue with this pr practice? Yep, all agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, the Minister has just joined us. From what I've been told, is that correct? Yes? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Carol. Look, thank you very much. We'll move then straight on to um, your briefing. You're very welcome here today, and thank you for joining us. And we understand that you need to leave at 3 o'clock. So I'll just hand over to you, Minister, um, if you want to brief the committee. So, listen, um, yes. I know I'm very just to stand me a list in, but I've got nine issues in, so I don't think I'm going to get them all covered within an hour. But what I would suggest doing is, um, if you are content enough, so I try and all the issues that you've asked for information on, I try and give an overview on those. Whatever isn't answered, I make sure that it's just bonded to in writing. And whatever else comes up that isn't on the list, I'll also ensure that it's just bonded to in writing. Are you happy for me to proceed in that, in that way? Yes, Minister, thank you, yes. Okay, so listen, um, thank you again and good afternoon, everybody. Believe it or not, I actually miss you, but I'll sure say nothing. Anyway, so um, look, as you'll all know, that the DFC has delivered uh, a way range of supports. So just dealing with the first issue in terms of the key priorities in relation to COVID, in terms of the response and indeed the recovery. And what, like our, that, our committee has been uh, on the record of saying that DSA have done exceptionally well in trying to deliver support that have really practically helped people right across the board, and certainly working with partners around food boxes and access to essential stores and stuff like that. So the, pra the practical support in terms of partners was delivered in partnership, as we know, with local councils, founding community sector faith-based groups, sporting groups, and many, many more who needed our help during that time. Um, DFC have secured an additional uh, 22.7 million uh, to ensure that they can, we can deliver across the board, but that also includes things like um, strategies about social inclusion to help vulnerable people, anti-poverty, child poverty strategies, we're also looking at things like uh, improving support for re reinvigoration of towns and cities. Um, and I'm also working with uh, Minister Poots about looking at small rural areas below 5,000 in terms of getting supports in for that. Um, anyway, also working to increase the social housing and the homelessness piece, as well as looking at financial supports around job readiness and all that. Um, we're also looking at things around um, meaningful engagement as part of co-design and inclusion pieces or of our stakeholders, our partners, um, and also our community kind of boundary sector, working with housing executive councils, um, and like many other people across the board. Um, so you'll all know that as part of the COVID-19 contingency planning, we're you know, reviewing the process very, very quickly to see what we could do. So I had a discussion today, emergency leadership, with emergency leadership group, members of SOLAS, uh, county and voluntary sector, loads of different sectors across the board. So everybody's clear about what really worked well. 
could have gone to the sector a lot quicker than local and central government, but we have also learned from that. So that's what we're doing at the minute. Um, we're also looking at, um, we all have to plan in case we have go through a second wave of COVID. So um, we're, we will update the committee um, on that, even if it's during the recess, we'll ensure that there's correspondence to that. But certainly plans remain in place about scaling up or scaling back on what the arrangements are. Um, and we've also you've been part of the TO strategy in COVID and dealing with COVID to ensure all our approaches are aligned with our executive colleagues across the piece. So you'll know that even as part of due monitoring round, um, which we had an announcement in the assembly, comprised of 56.1 million agreed by the executive and 22.7 was allocated against the new bids. Um, I was fortunate enough to get all my bids met bar two million for the Sports Hardship Fund. Um, so in terms of the COVID pressures, and that was one of the questions about recovery and what's next, um, we will be looking at trying to look after staff within DFC, because uh, we need to look at annual leave, but also additional supports for staff. We also need to look at the economic downturn related to benefit came increases which is potentially common, and looking at new employment programmes to assist individuals. Um, and at the minute, we, we anticipate making future bids at monitoring rounds or bids at future monitoring rounds. So one of the areas that is asked for an update on as well are the council, so funding in terms of councils and the sustainability. So we'll remember that we had uh, the DSC officials in, who certainly are looking at the first quarter when um, with over 20 million allocated to councils. So we're still working with um, our officials and councils around uh, the quarter, second quarter, and we're hoping to have that bid submitted to DFP or DOF very, very shortly. I mean, you'll all be aware, and even those who weren't councillors before, but we all accepted that local government lost up to, I think it's like 75% of their intake um, and that's going to have a big impact on services and we all agreed that we need to try and keep the, uh, the impact on councils, um, re reduce the impact of councils to raise the rate. I think one council is talking about 40% so just we need to have a look at that. I know Andy but certainly not exclusively Andy, others had mentioned the issues around the Charity Commission. Um, and, you know, its ability to dis discharge its functions. So, I mean, it is clear we need to find a way forward. Um, but I do want to try and give confidence as best as I can to the to the members of the committee um, that, you know, we, and certainly I met with the commissioner, the chief commissioner, and I also met with um, so the chief commissioner, Nicole Lappin, and I also met after uh, Nicole and met Seamus McAlevey from the chief, who's the chief executive of NICFA, because there were many complex issues raised by the judgment. But what I can say is that I fully understand uh, a number of aggrieved parties who do remain unhappy with the commission's decision, and it will be important to engage with them. But certainly, I recognise that past decisions were made in good faith, but they were made in error. So we need to find a way forward and we need to restore uh, public confidence, in my opinion. So the funding for the arts sector was the other one of the other issues. So as you know, there was £4 million uh, for, for arts that was secured in the June monitoring round. And you will also be aware that the CMS announced uh, that we had received £33 million as a Barnet consequential from 1.57 billion investment in the arts and culture. Um, and it will be for um, the executive to say and how that's spent. But certainly I want to repeat my commitment that I want to ensure uh, and make a strong case to executive colleagues um, that we you know, will have the money to be spent to support local arts, artists, culture, heritage. Who have really struggled as a result of coming out of this pandemic and certainly need to be part of any economic recovery. So we're working in partnership with uh, the Arts Council, but we're also um, talking to um, 
partners in the arts sector as well. Um, so let me see, changing places funding. Um, so members, you asked for an update on the changing places facilities, um, which we all agree are really important to ensure dignity and, and equality for people with disabilities. Um, so I'm aware that Connor Murphy, the finance minister, has tasked his department's built and standards branch uh, with incorporating mandatory requirements for changing places turned into local building regulations, and that's really important. So we'll keep us updated on that. In relation to the thirty million pounds for the changes places, changing places fund um, announced by the British Chancellor of the Exchequer in the budget, the Department for Finance is awaiting confirmation on whether a Barnet consequential will be forthcoming. Um, and we would expect this later um, in the financial year. Um, my department is also working in collaboration with the department with DERA, uh, with, with uh, PHA, with local councils. And we have developed an access and inclusion program aimed at improving access. So participation in arts and cultural and active recreation facilities right across is really, really important. So the two years that the programme has operated, a total of 87 projects across all 11 councils have received approximately around 1.7 million uh, with a range of improvement works. Um, the Neighbourhood Renewal Investment Fund, um, again, was mentioned, and um, we can hopefully look at um, you know, additional support, but we're looking at capital projects as well which has the aims of people and places strategy where capital projects include the provision of accessible change in place facilities within the community as well. And it is likely that the change in places provision will be discussed as work in progress on the department, on the development of its new disability strategy. You will be pleased to hear that um, we met with our officials this morning in relation to all those social strategies. So. For example, you ask for an update on those, and you know they'll include the disability strategy, anti-poverty, gender, sexual orientation, active agent, and child poverty strategies, all within DFC. Um, and we're you know we're looking at ways in which to bring that forward. So hopefully we'll be making an announcement soon. Um, but I'm I'm quite content of the progress to date, and I mean people will accept as did the sector at the emergency leadership group this morning accepted that COVID interrupted a lot of it, but we can't pause it forever. We just need to try and move on as best we possibly can in the time that we have. We also accepted, and again, just getting back to neighbourhood renewal, that any anti-poverty or child poverty strategies must be linked together. So neighbourhood renewal should be tied into and work from the criteria that's set out in child poverty and anti-poverty strategies. So that will be something that will be coming forward as well. Um, let me see. And again, you know, there will be a representation from each of the departments on um, the, the panels to ensure that discrete cross departmental work and any gaps that are there, particularly around equality and human rights, um, need to be closed. And the, the executive uh, representatives or the, the executive department's representatives will be working in partnership and be working around human rights and objective need and the co-design and participation remains at the heart of all these developments. So you asked about legislation which will be brought forward in 2020 and 2021. So hopefully we'll have some movement on our liquor licensing soon, just working with executive colleagues and getting that tidied up and thank you for your support in terms of the housing amendment um, bill which will be going forward for Royal Estant, um, and we've put down the pensions schemes, um, which will thankfully go through the normal passage of a committee rather than accelerate a passage. We're also looking at gambling legislation in relation to the regulation of gambling. Um, and we're looking at the decision around the policy content over this over the summer, and we're trying to get, you know, we need to address current laws in gambling, um, which, to be honest, go back to 1984 and further feed. So we need to bring those up. I'm certainly happy to, when we get the shape and that, share that and do presentations at the committee when we come back. In relation to the welfare mitigations response to COVID-19, um, 
you have asked for an update on welfare mitigations legislation and the provisions for continuing payments in the meantime. So um, the, the new decade new approach included a commitment to extend welfare mitigation schemes that we currently deliver. Um, and at the minute, we're looking, this will require new legislation um, and it will require a draft bill to continue with the mitigation payments. And it has been shared with executive colleagues, so that's something else we're coming back to. So um, but it, there is an urgency to see the introduction of a bill. And once this is agreed, um, it, it, you know, it can, it, my intention is to get this introduced without delay um, because we are coming up to a critical period. We've also drafted a subordinate legislation to extend other welfare mitigation. So, um, and the committee will have an opportunity to consider this before the draft legislation is laid. Um, but, you know, with, we, we are committed to closing any loopholes because um, the legislation is only extended, or the schemes are only extended until March, 31st of March, 2020. Um, so in relation to, and then we've got the NDNA, um, you know, legislation that will be coming out of that. I suppose one of the oldest pieces of legislation sitting in this department has been the sign language legislation. And it's something that I started when I was in DECAL. Um, I know Minister Given and Minister Hargy are taking this forward and was glad to see it mentioned in the NDNA, but we just need a horse on it because there's been loads and loads of consultation. The sector have been very clear that they want to see legislation, that they've had lots of consultation and appreciate it. But, the, but the, you know, there's no statutory obligation to provide support as it currently sits, and that doesn't sit well with any of us. Um, in terms of housing, I think the next one was, or let me see. Yeah, plans in relation to housing and homelessness. Um, you know, this is one of my, um, it, well, an issue that's always very close to me um, as part of my former spokesperson's brief, but certainly in this department, you can see there's a lot of great work that's happened. So we've got with the support of your sales, the housing amendment bill three to allow for the ONS reclassification. We are fully committed to building more social housing, and this will be at the core of any program to tackle housing stress. And I mean, it goes back to fundamentals of increasing the supply to reduce the demand. Um, we've never ever achieved any more than 2,200 social new bill starts in one year, and I personally want to change that as soon as possible. Uh, we're also looking at ways to increase um, opportunities around housing supply. Um, could be, well, obviously through co-ownership, but not just exclusively. Um, we also need to make the best use of our existing housing stock. Um, and by next year, we'll mark the housing site's 50th anniversary. Um, we need to bring forward uh, proposals that look at the uh, exclusion of the housing side of not having to pay corporation tax, you know, because it's in the region £13 million. And as we said during the debate, £13 million can, 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 you know, create a lot of money or a lot of houses. So we're going to look at that as well. Um, and uh, obviously the third priority, which I think is an imperative, is improving the rent, private rented sector, because given more than half of of our people who live in the private rented sector are half the more housing benefit than to the private rented sector and what there is the social sector. So, and there's no security at hand in that. So we, we need to, you know, we need to fix that. We also need to improve housing for the most vulnerable. And that includes, you know, for long term, particularly Kelly, I heard of Kelly earlier on about our brother and our father and our family around cares, but, but it's just gone on too long. We've also got Bamford report and subsequent reports, um, and each time, despite all the goodwill and all the great attempts, we just keep, you know, we don't we, we don't meet the targets that we set ourselves. So, um, and then in relation to uh, urban new generation, as I mentioned before, we're looking at a revitalisation programs for our towns and city centres, and we're going to talk to uh, Edwin tomorrow, and we're trying to look at joining up. Um, to make sure that, that you know towns below five population five thousand and that don't miss out either. So hopefully we'll have a good outcome for that. Um, and I've recently announced uh, three hundred uh, thousand support fund for business improvement districts so they can continue playing a key role. 
with businesses, local businesses and stakeholders, because it's, I mean, it is all about sustainability. Um, listen, there's loads of stuff where I'm not even going to go through, so I'm just going to stop there because I tried as best I could to faithfully address <clears throat> some of the issues that we are, that you raised. Um, and as I said at the start, Paula, if um, I've no doubt we'll have to come back to some of this, and you'll need more detail in writing. So I just want to pass it over to yourselves if you're happy enough. Okay, Minister, thank you very much. And can I say that we miss you also and look forward to you coming back and joining us over this side. And can you um, also pass on um, uh, our good wishes to Deidre Hargey as well when you're speaking to her from the committee also. Yeah. Um, we look forward yeah. to having her back also. Um, I'm just going yeah. to ask you a few just uh, questions all, all together, Minister, so we get uh, all the members have time to come in. So I'll just I'll just start now, and I just want to go back to what you were saying about the money, the 33 million um, that was that was announced or was given to Northern Ireland for for the arts venues um, fund. From what you're saying there, that there's no certainty whether that has been ring fenced for that, and it, that is with the executive at the minute. I mean, we know from the arts what they were saying that even the 33 million, although it's very welcome, will still not be enough. Um, so it, it certainly would be. I know the committee would be, uh, you know, backing you 100% there when we would say we would want to see it ring fenced. That's the first point. Um, the second one then was just to. Um, I mentioned to you, you talked about um, re recovery pace, um, employment program, and job readiness, and those various things which we know are essential. Um, we know again that the Westminster government had announced additional support for um, job centres and other organisations to help people find work. Are we going to be following along something similar on that, or maybe something better um, than that? And then I want to ask you then about the housing, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. And you and I both know we represent North Belfast. Um, no matter what side of the, the cultural divide you live in, there are people living in really poor housing, certainly in North Belfast, certainly as substandard. So we know that we need to see um, the, housing executive, the overhaul of the housing executive happen sooner rather than later. Um, so it's just really, do you see that happening within this mandate? Um, I know it's very much where, you're, where you come from and your background in housing as well, and I know you're a strong advocate for that. And also on that as well, I just want to ask about the Chancellor announced as well this week in a summer statement about the two billion um, for home insulation scheme, um, which I think is a fantastic. I think that would do, that would go some way to help in many of our constituents certainly um, that are living within social housing. Do you know? Are we getting any share of that money? Um, and uh, uh, again, if so, would would that be something that you would be uh, championing as well? I'll, I'll stop there with that little list. Okay, so listen, I'll start. So thank you for that. So I'll start with your last two points first. So for example, um, or look, a any money that's announced will be arguing for Barna Consequential. So just to give you assurance on that. Um, certainly in relation to the job readiness and the home insulation scheme, we will be um, bidding for those. Um, I, I, I believe that I visited the Jobs and Benefit Office in, in East Belfast yesterday in Andy's constituency and the work that the staff are doing there, I'm sure replicated across all those centres right across. But I mean, they, they have bespoke uh, ideas as do our officials about making sure whatever programs we bring forward are meaningful, but actually are effective. So, for example, we all have memories of what we don't want, so we just need to get through that. But just to give you the assurance, uh, members, that any announcement made will be seeking the Barney Consequentials. And indeed, after the British Chancellor makes his, his uh, statement, our own finance minister will be breaking that down to hopefully work out what it means for each of the departments. Um, so you're right in terms of the installation scheme. Um, even if you go back to the Savills report, which Fra will remember very well, uh, and indeed Kevin and others, I'm sure, the, I think the total for maintenance was going into billions. And given that the housing executive is nearly 50 years old, um, a lot of maintenance programmes were cut, particularly in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and that's had an impact. It's had an impact on poverty and it's had an impact actually on people's health, particularly when you look at some of the dampness. So we'll certainly be looking at that. In relation to the arts, it's the same thing. So the 
five seven billion announced we'll be getting thirty three million consequentials, and I'd be making a bid. Um, and it is fairly. I mean, it is specific in terms. Of, it's for the arts and cultural sector because, as you know, libraries and museums and galleries are all run by local government or come from local government funds, and then the arts are probably separate. And that's the way it is here, to a fair degree. But um, but we also know that even within arts itself, there are um, freelancers, there are individual artists, there are venues, theatres. Um, and there are also people who are creatives within that are struggling. We didn't, maybe didn't get access to funds and go through real some financial hardship. So certainly I'd be bidding for the money, encouraging excited colleagues to support those bids. And then we'll just take um, ideas that uh, Deirdre Hargy had started to look at some of those gaps and then we'll just bring them forward. Okay, Carol, Kevin's just reminded me here that it was a figure of seven billion um, around the, the maintenance. Um, just to, uh, going back, just just a quick um, follow up there again, just to ask you about the the, the housing executive and um, looking at the at restructuring of the housing housing executive. And I know it's something um, that we have spoken about in this assembly for a number of years. Um, and just asking um, again. Do you see us that coming about before the end of this mandate, or certainly making a good start on it? Well, I, I mean, I know that we we are going to make a good start on it with the view of revitalising the housing anxiety so they can certainly look at building. Uh, we need to clear the obstacles. I mean, some of you may remember even during the negotiations and the about restoring the institution and restoring the assembly. You know, we we I put forward. The whole issue around clearing historical debt and certainly, you know, wiping off, not wiping off, but removing the housing sector from having to pay corporation tax. Because the claim was the housing sector couldn't borrow while they had historical debt and paid back all that. And I think it is just, we just need to remove the obstacles. But we need to make sure it's fit for purpose. So while we need a single housing authority, we all also need to make sure there's one that's match fit. Um, I have concerns around issues around the delivery and the securement of land. Uh, I have issues around the fact that we need a strong housing advocate for the homeless. I do think the housing executive have done a good job, but I also think they need to do better. And, um, and in order for them to do better, we need to create the circumstances and the structures for that to happen. So we have listened, all of us listened to Housing Exciter about the historical debt, all of us listened about the corporation tax, but we need to make sure that those areas, those families who are living in acute stress are housed. We need to make sure the families that are living in uh, properties that need a complete overhaul are sorted, but we also need to make sure the Housing executive isn't using 50-year-old practices in the 21st century. So that needs to look at new construction methods, procurement, uh, and then some. So, I mean, I, you all know where I stand in all this, um, but I, I think it's important that we can't get this done by the end of this mandate, that we do enough work, that whoever's coming behind us can certainly pick it up. Okay, thank you, Minister. I'm going to open it up now to members. Um, I have Johnny, I have Kelly and Fra. So any other members want to ask questions? There we go. All hands go up. Um, thank you. And can I just remind members, we only have the Minister for a further 30 minutes. So if you could follow my lead and be precise and come straight in with your questions and no speeches. So I'll go then to Johnny first. Thank, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Minister for coming at the earliest opportunity. I, th I think it's good for us to hear her department's priorities, given uh, what we will have to react to, because we're, we're receiving a lot of presentations from all different sectors, yeah. and it's that we, we get the, the picture from yourself in terms of the department. Uh, it's just the three points, the sports funding, and I know there was an additional bid, and, and I do welcome that which was allocated, but I would encourage the Minister, and I know she did when she was in the committee, but recognise uh, the huge inadequacy there is in terms of the, the funding that has been allocated to sporting organisations who, yes, uh, there was funding allocated for, and many of them played their part in, in the COVID response, but it's now down to an issue of viability of those sporting organisations, and I trust that she will continue to fight for additional funding to allow those sporting clubs to exist and flourish into the future. Uh, 
the same vein of, of sports and, and you will be aware and I know you were actually the person on the committee at the time that uh, requested a briefing from the IFA that wasn't forthcoming but I see we do have a letter with it. I, I would ask the Minister also to, to uh, through the department to request a meeting with the IFA uh, to dis- discuss ongoing issues. I know the committee hopefully will hear from them at the earliest opportunity but I'm particularly alarmed when I seen uh, in yesterday's Belfast Live about the concern over the the, F, the Irish FA's code of conduct and ethics, uh, I know there's a dispute ongoing there with regard to the Middlestar Association, um, and again, it causes some concern to me as a member of the committee. And I know it's something that maybe you can take up uh, from a ministerial mm-hmm. perspective, but we can further interrogate uh, as a committee to see if we can get an adequate resolution. Um, and also, and, and finally, just in relation to the charities and. Again, I welcome Andy. Uh, get, uh, it wasn't at the last meeting, but I am firmly on the record of saying that we need to have the Charities Commission before the committee at the earliest opportunity. I welcome that you have also uh, had correspondence with them, but I would encourage you potentially to look further into this matter because there is serious concern among many charitable organisations regarding their status, uh, the unlawful nature of much of the committee's work by the virtue of the Court of Appeals ruling. Uh, this, is, this has caused a lot of concern uh, regarding the discharge of its duties. Uh, and, and again, I would encourage you to investigate this from a ministerial perspective, because I know we as a committee certainly have serious matters to look into in relation to how the Charities Commission discharged its duties and what the current ruling means for uh, them going forward and, and the constitution and uh, status of the many charitable organisations in Northern Ireland at present. So, Johnny, thank you very much. And I'll start with your last point first. I have no intention of not ensuring we get to the bottom of what happened. We're still interrogating the judgment in terms of what it means. But in between that, we met, as I said earlier, with the Charities Commissioner. And we also met with Seamus McAlevey because a lot of groups were distressed when they heard that. Uh, There has to be an acceptance that there's a public confidence issue here. Um, No one is... I haven't heard anyone saying that they don't need to go through regulation um, or scrutiny in order to get their status because once they get their status, they look after it very well. They just feel that that relationship wasn't reciprocated and the issue is that the delegation of authority um, should have been made by commissioners rather than uh, the organisation and that's had an impact. So be rest assured we will keep this under focus do we get a better resolution. I'm happy to write to the IFA as a result of your request uh, and ask them and say that these issues were raised and people have a response and I'll copy it back to yourselves. Um, I bid for four million for the Sports Hardship Fund and I got two. So I know it doesn't seem like a big pile of money but it would have made such a big difference to a lot of the groups, particularly given the work that they're, they have done through COVID. They will do again, God forbid we ever get another phase, but they'll be there regardless. And particularly the work that they do within the community around health and wellbeing, mental health, um, and everything else that's positive and good. I just want to try my best to get additional money. So I'll give you that commitment as well. I will ensure where possible, if there are opportunities to get additional money in, particularly around some of those hardship funds and helping grassroots clubs, I will do that too. Okay, th- thanks. And just to follow up, just to maybe inf- on the IFA issue, it's just it's one of the aspects of the code of conduct was that the clubs should or the representatives should act in the best interest of the IFA at all times. A lot of uh, representatives feel that this is in conflict with their responsibilities to represent the needs and concerns of their respective associations, which they're put on the IFA board to do. That's that's all just important. Okay. Okay, thank you, Johnny. I'm going to move on to Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think we'll be looking forward to you coming back. Um, there's a lot you have mentioned there about housing. Um, and I was just wondering, um, we have the housing allocation scheme that's under review and, of course, the reform of, of the housing executive that you've spoken about. 
in New Decade New Approach, there was a discussion about having a new housing outcome added to the programme for government. Um, I'm just thinking all of that housing could fit in there and where you need help or assistance or financial input from other departments, it would be useful to have that. So that's my first question is, where are we with that housing out, um, outcome? Um, I'll ask all these quickly so that can, we can move on. Um, you've said earlier about the Sports Hardship Fund, and Johnny's asked that, so I'll not ask that one, but the increased unemployment has me a little bit concerned. Um, the increased, it's terrible anyway, but my concerns will be the amount of people moving into universal credit now means that there may be a bigger um, bill for the welfare mitigations that we have here, which are right to provide. I'm just very aware have you got enough money in the department to meet all of those mitigations given the expected increase to those being unemployed and coming into benefits and I hope that the executive are, are looking at that because that is something that we've all committed to. Um, the last thing I was going to say was, to be honest, was a thank you. Um, you know, when I hear somebody talking about a commitment to changing places toilets, um, I could give you a big hug because it has been such an uphill battle. Um, so to, to hear that coming forward is great. And at last, we also hear with the revitalisation, um, the rural towns and villages being considered for revitalisation. We have some of the most inaccessible villages because they just councils can't afford and DFI can't afford to fix footpaths and everything. So if we can have that and bring businesses back, that will certainly help. Um, but just those those main two questions about that housing outcome. With the housing allocation scheme, even if you had an update on that and the increased unemployment, is there enough money for you? So we're looking at the housing allocation scheme because this has been out for consultation for a lot of years and there are some issues within it you're right I, I i also want to try and link it into your housing outcome as part of the program for government because i think regardless what we do as executive ministers we need to do it on an outcomes based approach and people need to see that not only reflected in the new decade new approach but we still haven't agreed what our program for government is and we are working our way through that and i'm telling you Better thing it's phenomenal. We are working our way through all these issues in a very collegiate way, so that's good news. Um, Kelly, I, I'm for retrofitting. I'm for looking at all those things which could be a crossover between myself, economy, finance, you know, where you can do this and do it not on the cheap, but certainly could do it that it's going to be cost effective, but most of all improve the quality of life. So we're looking at all that, but it doesn't mean to say looking at it means nothing's going to happen. Um, where we can look at retrofit and we should. It's going to be massive amounts of money, but when it is spent to save, frankly, you know, going back to the economics. In terms of employment, um, look, I, there's never going to be enough money in the department's budget. So we're looking at um, the anticipated uh, costs, particularly when furlough runs out and if people aren't brought back into their work and we don't really know what it's going to look like, but we can just plan for the best. So I'm content, officials are doing that um, and they're doing it to the best of their ability. Um, the revitalisation of towns and villages is important as well. Not so much and not just alone. Um, like I, I live in the New Lodge, I live in North Belfast, I'm about five minutes from the city centre. So I take footpaths for granted, but when I go to a village that doesn't have a footpath, then when people talk to me about rural inequality, I know exactly what they're talking about. Um, so Minister Poots and I are looking at ways in which we can try and join some of this stuff because um, I appreciate that rural families see these announcements on the news, on the TV for towns and cities, and they're still sitting without a footpath. So it's just things as basic as that. And again, just in response to the uh, commitment to made to Johnny and indeed the other members of the committee, you know, if, if we can get additional money into sports and particularly around sports hardship funds, we'll do that. Um, but as you will know, there are competing pressures on things um, and all we can do is, you know, make our best bid, which we did. Um, but we still received two, two million um, and I'm appreciative of that, but certainly could do with a bit more. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Uh, Fra? Fra McCann? Chairman. Yep, go ahead. Go ahead, Fra. Can't hear you. Has he dropped out? Oh. You're back in the room again. Fra, can you hear us? 
Okay, I'm going to go on to Andy and then I'll come back to Fred. Andy, you're next. Thanks, Chair. And just the outset, uh, the current interest of the charity trustee, and can I thank the Minister for engagement uh, in respect of the, the piece around the charities? And, you know, obviously it's important to mention that charities are still charities by law, and, and this doesn't change that decision in that respect. But I'd encourage the Minister and, and the Charities Commission to communicate regularly with, with the registered charities and those indeed going through the process, because that's vitally important in that respect. Quite a multitude of questions have already been asked, so I'll not, I'll not touch on those again. Just thank the Minister for her commitment around the changing places, toilets, uh, and really encourage the Minister to really consider bringing forward a fund uh, in, in that respect to help uh, the implementation. And just then, if you're able to give any time frame around, uh, I know you'd outlined the welfare mitigations, but even a time frame when we might expect to see that. I'll, I'll leave it there because I appreciate we're under pressure for time. No I, I appreciate. So the mitigations, there, there are sticking points around bedroom, what's known as a bedroom tax and, and possibly others, because what we need to do is to ensure whatever we do is meeting the needs and it's going beyond the 31st of March next year. Uh, but they're not impossible. We are actively trying to get this sorted as soon as possible. Um, you're right about changing places and toilets and accessibility. Um, and, you know, it just... You, you, we, we need to ensure that when we have public services and public amenities that they're for all the public and not just some. So I have taken that commitment very seriously, as did Deirdre Hargy, because it was, you know, one of the issues on top of my brief when I came into the department. The point that you raised to me last week and again um, today about the charities, let me give you an assurance. I will try my very best to work with the Charities Commission and indeed representatives of the community and boundary sector and charities to ensure that not only is public confidence increased, but mis that mistakes are made are, are, are put to right as soon as possible. And it's not about just doing it in haste, it's about getting it right. The onus is on the Commission to build public confidence, uh, but it's also on myself to ensure that the Commission do that. So that the commitment I'll give you is to ensure it's the best mobility that happens. Um, and I hope that's answered your questions, Andy. Right, thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, Fra, are you back with us again? Sure. Go ahead. Can you hear me, Chair? Sure? I can indeed, yes. Fra, go ahead. Right, I don't know what happened. This uh, computer threw a fit there. Uh, I think, uh, or maybe it was me. I don't know. I'm trying to work out it. But I want to thank the minister for her presentation. Uh, it's very precise and to the point in many of the issues uh, that 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 we're facing. Uh, but in terms of uh, local government, we had the presentation from Solis, and I know speaking uh, to to other uh, people, members of council and Nulga, uh, that there 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 have been growing concerns and talk about uh, rates increases of double digits of other impacts on, on services provided uh, bec uh, because of the uh, possible cut in funding. Uh, as I see it, uh, can the Minister tell us if our department is working actively with these uh, organisations, including the councils, to ensure that people do not face uh, uh, the double digit raises and rates? And uh, secondly, if she could also uh, say if there has been any discussion, and I know it's difficult at the present time, and there are the possibility of additional uh, powers going back to councils. Okay, Tra, thanks. Um, so first of all, the department are working actively with all the 11 councils. I mean, we've seen the presentation, um, particularly around the supports in the first quarter, and the due diligence that was done by each of those councils was done on the basis of what is actually needed rather than councils. Um, just, you know, maybe just asking for money, you know, on what they'd like to do. So that work is going to be finished for the second quarter. Um, and it is really important that, you know, like, it, 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 this, these are political decisions about rates. But I'll just say this. It's impossible to keep a very, very low rate but have a big expectation around services deliveries. And, and I think those conversations are going to be had. But at the end of the day, that is down to the councils and the councillors who are the council rather than the council officials. Secondly, uh, in relation to additional powers, 
Um, I mean, the reason why some of ours weren't transferred to local government because we couldn't get agreement on regeneration. We couldn't get agreement on a quality proof and all the rest. And just hope as we progress through the, this mandate that there's a bit more, I suppose, political maturity with us all that we can look to see what we can transfer over. I have absolutely no doubt. I mean, I was in council from 2003 to 2007, so I'll declare an interest. Um, I, I didn't particularly find it a very pleasant environment, I'll be honest, but what I did recognise was the work and the ability to do work very quickly and very well and the connection of local residents and neighbourhoods to their local council. I mean, the loyalty there is unreal. But we also need to make sure that what resources are transferred from any department to council that they're going to be transferred to do what they're supposed to do. So we'll we'll still be working with councils and even with colleagues in Nilga and Solace to ensure that happens. And hopefully we may get, you know, the transfer of powers and we can get political agreement what they all look like. Because we can't have an interpretation of one council and a different interpretation of another. And and that's unfortunately where we've been. But certainly um we're keen to look to see what else we can do. But certainly the pressure at this stage is looking at the second quarter of financial support from DFC to councils, and that exercise is almost completed. Sure, and can I also uh, commend the, the Minister and certainly uh, Deirdre on their commitment uh, and their own historic debt and uh, the corporate corporation tax. I think that uh, that uh, we can all look forward, as we have done for quite a number of years, of bringing the housing strategy that has been discussed to some fruition, and it could make a, a new beginning uh, for housing. And uh, again, uh, no, no doubt the commitment of the minister in terms of working uh, with the deaf community, uh, and uh, the, 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 and certainly the, the, I would raise again the whole question of those who are playing partially said it. Uh, that they're taking into consideration when any strategy has been developed. Uh, but equally, they find it very, very difficult in the terms of uh, negotiating uh, the footpaths and many other obstacles that that uh, that they 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 see. I believe that's crucially important, and I think, I think that there are also on another element as as the towns and city centres and villages that have been decimated uh, over the years, most of a big lot of by out of town shopping centres. And uh, that there are enough st- ma- that many strategies that has been done of some of them. And there's no need for one, a big prolonged thing. But there are m- many strategies that are land, or if they can be brought together, gone through. Uh, surely in between, uh, and then they can get a good strategy that allows you to move ahead with it. Okay, Fra, I think you have spoken for long enough. If that's okay, <laughs> I'm bringing you to a, a halt there. Um, I'm going to move on. I've still got Sinead, Mark and Robin and I know we're under time pressures here so can I go to you Sinead? Yeah, thank you Taryn. Thanks to the Minister. Listen, you've covered a lot of the stuff I wanted to bring up um, to do with the arts because we were both at the, the, the recent briefing um, but just to say, you know, and I know the Minister is aware of this but um, people in that sector were only able to avail of one of the, the grants that were available to people over the last uh, few months um, so really, you know, a stabilisation fund of some of some sort would be really welcome, but I think I need to make the point as well. You know, where we have the, the need for the the venues or rescue package for the venues, we have to be very mindful that there's community, cultural and, and, and arts festivals out there that equally need our attention and equally need um, supported in the time ahead as well, because we know the valuable role they play. So I know you were saying you're engaging with the arts council and other stakeholders. So um, you know, very often these community. Uh, festivals are, are, are not really part of that discussion so and I know you'll bear that in mind going, going forward um, I want to follow on from Johnny's question in terms of NIFL clubs and the IFA and I know I've brought this up before and I'm not going to rehash it again but just to say you were, you were saying to Johnny there about um, that you will be engaging with the IFA and can I just put it on your radar that um, the UEFA Hattrick Fund it's 4 million annually that's awarded to, to um, the IFA um, UEFA have said that can be that's at the, the, the discretion of the IFA to distribute however they see fit, um, and they did reference COVID in that in that caveat. So, you know that's there that can be distributed um, among the clubs if the will is there to do it by by the IFA, and also as well it might be useful to include in any discussions with the IFA. They do hold approximately five million in cash reserves. You know just ten percent of that reinvested into the league would go a hell of a long way. Um, 
So I just want to put that on your radar for your discussions with, with the IFA. I'm um, really glad to hear about the uh, the rural revitalisation. You know, I can take you to loads of a whistle stop tour of the villages in South Down that don't have um, don't have footpaths and pavements. Um, and just I, I just the sub regional um, stuff was just absent from from your briefing. But you know, I know that's you know you have given a commitment to look at that. But it's just to keep that live and, and just to keep that on your radar that. You know that is a big gap um, in terms of um, local grassroots sport, sporting organisations, soccer, GA, rugby, and lots of other sports as well. well. You know they needed it before, but they will definitely need it post COVID um, in terms of some sort of rescue package. So, you know, I'll leave it there and, and I'll let other members come in then. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Minister, do you want to respond to any of that? So um, I'm going to write to the IFA. So I'm going to. Um, you know, add those bits in about the UEFA hot trick fund and also, um, you know, given the fact that they've raised, they've got uh, reserves as well. So any correspondence, I'll add those in, I'll share with the, the committee. Um, I am aware that, um, you know, even some of the groups recently, after 33 million announcements said it wasn't enough, um, while they welcomed it, um, and we're never going to have enough money for all the things we want to do, but certainly we need to make a priority and work uh, within the communities around festivals and activities uh, need to be reflected in, in any bid going forward as well. Because uh, some of the big things would swallow that £33 million up in a blink of an eye. Um, so I'll just leave it at that and then try and take other um, questions from other members. Okay, thank you, Minister. I then have Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Minister. Much of the, the, the headline sort of stuff has been covered in other questions, and if not in the questions, uh, through the Minister's fairly expansive answers. I was wondering maybe, I, I could have missed it because I turned on the printer here. It hasn't been on in a, a couple of months, and it sounded like a helicopter taking off, so I could have missed it. But it was in terms of the mitigations, uh, Minister, you said about the piece of work that needs done, the bill that will need brought to extend them, and you said you had a view of, to improve them or, uh, I suppose, st strengthen uh, mitigations or get some new ones. I was wondering if maybe you'd be in a position to elaborate any on that at the moment. So the mitigations, well, well I mean, any additional mitigations will be about the processes rather than uh, the principles often. So it'll be what we already agreed politically. Um, I mean, that's my ambition to get that sorted because anything in top up will require new political negotiation work. And to be honest, I don't want to open that Pandora's box. I want to try and secure what we'll have to ensure that there's continuity of service there and people aren't impacted by the, you know, impacts of Korea star and I just want to make, I don't want to confuse, misrepresent that I'm going to, bring something else in, but that's not the case. If I could, I absolutely would. Um, if I could, I would scrap universal credit just to be on the record, but there you go. I can't. I haven't put it do. I'm going to have to pay for it. So it's just so it's just to get to get that for you. We still have to get agreement in the executive to get these extended but beyond the 31st of March um, and then work out the probably the legislation, what way that legislation needs to be reflected. Is it just looking at the regulations that we have currently, or is it, you know, a, a new piece of legislation which will undoubtedly have to, to go through accelerated passage? I don't know yet. It all depends what we agree. Um, but that's where we're at. OK, thank you, Carl. And it was also very heartening to hear from you about how you are working with other ministers on a whole range uh, yeah. of, of issues. You mentioned there your work with DERA. Uh, I, I was wondering, do you know, are you working with other departments to look at community groups, for example, that, that fall outside normal funding? So, so, to be honest with you, the normal funding stuff, so if you even look at Neighbourhood Renewal, that that fund was almost um, closed by the ASB then, um, and we need to have new opportunities, particularly when groups are doing work on the ground. Um, so any other collaboration with either Justice, Health, um, DERA, or any of the, even the economy, but mostly those other departments that are more front-facing, I'm kind of getting into. There's, um, there's NDNA commitments that we all have to meet, so we're all going to have to work for each other. We all live in each other's shelters, so sometimes we all have to put our hands in our pockets 
uh, to help some of the commitments that we signed up to as political parties. So I'm completely open to that. Where it's not in relation to community groups. So, for example, we're working with your colleague, the Minister for Infrastructure, Nicola Mullen, on looking at infrastructure around particularly the social housing development programme. Um, and there's loads of things that we can, where the will is, that we can work together. Not only is it a good thing to do, but actually it may save a bit of money and we may actually get more done. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to move on to Robin, because I'm conscious of time. Just and then if there's a, a bit left at the end, we'll go back to it. Members again. Go ahead, Robin. Hey, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for attending today. Uh, I wonder, Minister, could I ask you about the two questions, actually, one around the legislation and the regulation of gambling, which I think we all know is way, way out of date, and I think we know the negative impact that uh, gambling has on individuals and the reports about uh, children at a younger and younger age becoming involved in gambling and addicted to gambling, and indeed the impact that it has on uh, destroying family life, uh, uh, creating poverty and, and indeed leading to mental health I I issues. We know that the technology uh, around today has created a, a greater opportunities for the gambling industry. And sir, could you just expand on your thinking around gambling uh, at, at the minute and the legislation? So there are, you're right, Robin, there are lots of concerns, particularly with, I suppose, more immediate impact or access to the internet, because even with COVID and a lot of boogies were closed, a lot of people went to the internet in order to gamble. And that's one aspect. You'll also be aware within your own constituency, as most of us are across ours, the access to the um, the gambling, the slot machines and all that stuff. Um I mean, some chippies you can go into, you can get have a, a gamble as well. So that's that's also going to have to be looked at. Um, but we're also looking at things like um, gaming machines, prize competitions, even the advertising and gambling and any new legislation. And we need, absolutely need to put measures in to protect vulnerable people and people who have a problem with gambling. So um, we are, uh, we have started the process of looking at the consultation or at the the, the legislation, what it will look like, um, and we hope to make progress on that. Um, certainly after the summer recess, uh, and like the pension scheme legislation, we hope to try and get it in so it meets the legislative timetable within this mandate, so we don't have to rush it through accelerated passage. So hopefully. Uh, coming out the other side of the summer, we'll start to see a bit more development in that and certainly going through the committee, Robin. Could, could I put this one to you, Minister? In terms of the size of Northern Ireland and the, 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 the need, the, the, I suppose, the global impact of, of some of the gambling industry, laws in Northern Ireland would not have a significant impact upon that industry if we got to the stage of of imposing fines on them. Is there a need for us to be, rather than thinking about specific laws in Northern <clears throat> Ireland, but a very close uh, relationship with laws throughout the United Kingdom in order to make that major impact? Robin, the problem is, even from some of the public consultations that we've had, and even listening to people in the sector, they don't feel that the laws in Britain go far enough. Right. Like, for example... Yeah. yeah, so like one of the things that we're, we've found out is there's really a big growing concern about the social and health problems caused by levels of gambling here. You mentioned that yourself, four times higher mental health rates and everything else. So what we want to do is, and this, this isn't political, Robin, it doesn't matter if the better legislation was in Westminster than it was in Astor House, I would go for the best legislation. So this isn't, you know, you know, about me being politically biased here. It's just that even through our own consultations, people here are saying the laws in Britain don't go far enough. And part of the problem with that is, and I'll say this, that the feel that the gambling uh, lobbyists have too big a reach into Westminster. And they also feel that the internet is a big problem on how that's regulated and the pushback from some of the big um, internet companies. So 
it does it is a mammoth task but it's not impossible and i think we have a, a much more we have a stronger ability to bring forward better and stronger legislation which will protect people who have issues with having gambling okay can, can I, I i'm not sure how we in northern ireland might impact on the internet but i, I agree with you about the laws in in yeah. westminster can i ask you minister just very about, quickly very quickly about housing and, and really yeah. whether or not whether or not you envisage getting to the stage where the housing executive would be in a position uh, to build new houses again, in addition to what the housing associations can do. I, I want the housing side to build new houses, and it's it's as well as rather than stead off. Yeah, because in our, yeah, in all our constituencies, there's a, there's a massive housing problem, but we do need to get rid of the obstacle dropping, and that's historical tax and the corporation tax. We also need to give them the barriers and the programme for government commitments with the outcomes to deliver more social housing. I don't know if we're going to do it within this mandate. It would be my ambition to try, but certainly we need to put down the foundations as part of the new decades, new approach, but as well as any subsequent programme for government would do to ensure that it happens, because it does need to happen. There's no two ways about it. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that the debt problem is there, but indeed the ambition is there to allow the housing executive to build. That's good news. Okay, thank you, everybody, um, and thank you, Minister, for your time today. Um, can I just ask then, Minister, if you could provide the committee with a note on your priorities for the remainder of the mandate, just to enable us to then do future plan whenever we get back yeah. in the autumn time. And also, just one more point that Andy wanted to bring up. He didn't want to bounce you with the question, but he just would like you to take, um, if you could get back to the committee about it as well. My bounce and Andy, nice we are. Hi, you are, you are indeed. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Andy. Uh, Minister, I don't know if you'll have an opportunity yeah. to see it, the, the High Court ruling, the successful ruling in relation to the legal definition of terminal illness and benefit law in Northern Ireland. Uh, I know there was cross-party support around this um, when we were in our hiatus, so it's just obviously, um, as a committee, I'm sure members would want to be kept informed of any uh, work that the department's doing on that in terms of amending the, legis the laws here. Well, can I, and can I just let you know that I've seen it on Twitter, so what I've asked the officials to do is to get me a brief, an urgent brief, on what the implications are for this, um, and then, depending on what they are, I'd feed them back to the committee as well. Um, and just to, in the last, just to recap, I've taken a note myself of the things that you've raised and the queries that you've asked. We also know when you leave the meeting, things come into your head. So, you know, as long as people don't rip it. And I'm saying that in terms of we might get it all done in one correspondence. So it may be ongoing. But I want to get you as, as many questions answered uh, before the end of the recess and then when the committee meets, even if the correspondence comes when that happens. Um, but I just want to thank you all um, for your question. Hopefully you have got the information that is has asked for and whatever additional information you have asked for, you will get that in the time you question as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks thank you, well, Minister. Sir. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, members. We'll, we'll go back. Yes, Kevin's just reminded me where we are here on the agenda, in case I lose myself. Did we get agreement around the chairperson's business? Just before I move off that, we got agreement on that, about um, uh, just the, the delegated authority. OK, we'll move on then to chairperson's business. Oh, no, sorry, draft matters minutes. Rising. Matters are rising. Goodness, no, we haven't done draft minutes yet, have we? Haven't we? Done draft minutes. No, we haven't. OK, members, we're going to turn to agenda item number three, which is draft minutes. Um, you'll find that at page six of your meeting packs, and that was for our meeting held last week on the 1st of July. Can I, are members content with the minutes as drafted? Yep. All content? Thank you. Check the board there. Yep, all content. We'll move then on to agenda item number four, which is matters arising. Um, sorry, one moment. Mark Durkin, your hand is up on draft minutes. Mark, do you want to go ahead? Sorry, I had got cut off in full flow with the minister uh, and didn't get the raise uh, an issue that I had wanted to, but no, it's fine for the draft minutes. Sorry. Uh, the minister was just saying, I don't know whether you caught her, Mark, at the end for a briefing there. She said if there's anything else any other members want um, to ask or discuss, um, as long as we don't go overboard, she's more than happy to take um, any anything through. 
Well, it was really just a wee add-on, maybe do the letters she was writing to the IFA, uh, I suppose maybe they express concerns, and it's concerns I think that a lot of clubs uh, across the North share with how the decision had been taken to wind their season up, uh, and it resulted in the, the relegation of, of a, a North West club uh, institute who've been decimated. They were decimated by a flood a couple of years ago, a fire uh, since then. And all the clubs were in agreement in the, in the Premiership, as I understand it, that there was a better way to proceed than to, to relegate anyone and the, the financial consequences of that. So I might touch base with the Minister to see if she can add that on as well. Okay, well, look, Mark, and the same for any members here at all. If you want to pass any issues on to the committee clerk, the committee clerk then can do it officially from the committee, and then the answers come back to the committee as a whole, which is probably the best way to do those things. So, if I can just ask um, if members would do that, that would be that would be good. And then, can I then move? Happy to move on then. So, everybody's happy with the draft minutes. There was nobody that single signalled that they weren't happy, and we'll get back on the track here and then agenda item number four which is matters arising that's not correct it's not where we are folks yes it is okay members you've been provided at page 12 with a copy of the latest report from the examiner of statutory rules and um, the examiner draws attention to sr 2020-89 the statutory sick pay general coronavirus amendment number four regulations northern ireland 2020 which breached the 21 day rule the examiner accepts the department's explanation for the breach which occurred in the context of the response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so, well, members happy enough with that. We'll move on then to, you've been provided at page 20 with a response from NIFL in relation to committee queries on the return to football. Can I ask members any comments or queries or content to note? I've got Sinead and then I've got Johnny. Thanks, Chair. It's just a note um, and I think had we not had the discussion with the minister and the opportunity to raise our concerns, um, not concerns, raise, raise some issues, um, I would probably be suggesting that we reply um, in terms of the, the points that I um, raised because I see they've included in terms of their, uh, their financial support for clubs everything other than looking internally to the, the resources that they do have to hand at the minute. Um, so you know, I'm content that I've raised it with the minister and I, I'm content that she will, will bring it up with them in their discussion. So um, I think I'll, I'll wait and see what the outcome of, of that is unless any other members have any have any questions on it or any issues. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Johnny, you were waving. You, yeah, no, it's, it's in the same issue. And again, I don't know if Sinead would be in, in agreement, but while we have asked, and maybe Mark, it maybe goes back to Mark's point earlier, while we've already asked the minister to engage with the IFA, I still think it's important from a committee's perspective that we also write to them in relation to the concerns that have been outlined. Uh, for me in particular, I, I would like more ex explanation around that dispute from the members' code of conduct and ethics. Uh, but again, a number of questions were raised by different members regarding the IFA, while uh, the exception of how the league was rounded up uh, you know, there was winners and losers in that. I'm not going to get into that that argument because put it down where we're brought up. Uh, but but in general, there there's there is considerable degree of concern, and I think uh, from a committee's perspective, we we have said that we would be wanting them before the committee. But perhaps a dual approach for us to also have correspondence with the IFA would be helpful. Okay. Um, so I'll second that proposal, yeah. Okay, Sinead second that, so we're happy enough with that. The committee will do that. That's grand. Okay, members, I'm glad you two are here because I just watch football under sufferance at home, really. That's by the height of it. So thank you. Hold on. Mark, you wanted to come in and say something? Your hand's up on the screen. No, 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 I'm nope, sorry. you're all right. That's okay. That's grand. Sure, then... <laughs> all right, well, we'll move on then. Um, members, you've been provided page 24 with a departmental response to the committee queries on the review of welfare reform mitigation measures. And I know we had further questions there with the minister also on that. So members content to note that also? Yeah, all content. Good stuff. Um, then at page 26, you've been provided with a briefing paper from the Ulster Orchestra in relation to the impact of COVID-19. It was very interesting to what they have sent through it. Um, so just want to ask, is there any comments or content to note and for, for now and then schedule a briefing then with the Ulster Orchestra um, when we uh, start our session again in autumn? Is everybody happy with that? Yeah? Okay. We'll then move on to...
Okay. Uh, page 36 then of your packs. Um, you've been provided with uh, a signposting ad to go to the three, three main newspapers for the committee's call for evidence on the pension schemes bill. Are again members content that that ad is issued to the three main newspapers? Yes? All content? Good stuff. All right, let me just fix my papers now. Right, we're now. Could I ask you to go back one? What is the status of the Ulster Orchestra? What, what sort of a body is it? Well, they're, fun they're funded body, so they are. By the arts council. Funded by the Arts Council. What, what, what kind of a body is it? Do you mean are they like professional or semi professional? Is that what you mean? No, just what I mean. Are they or is CIC? You have to register as a body, you have to register as a, a private limited company, yeah. you have to register as a community organisation. What, what sort of a body is it? I'll find it out. Well, I can find that out for you. Yeah. So we can. Yeah. Okay. We'll find that out. All right, members, everybody content then? We move on to agenda item number six. Uh, which is a briefing by the Northern Ireland Union of Supported Employment on future funding for disabil disability employment services. Uh, members, you have been uh, provided with papers starting at page 39 of your meeting pack. Um, uh, I understand that there may have been some recent changes to the lineup today, so I just need to confirm who our witnesses are. I have down um, Norman Sturt, who is the chairperson of NIUSC. Paula Jennings, CEO of Stepping Stones, Stephen Matthews, CEO of Cedar Foundation, and Clara Laverty from Action for Hearing Loss. So I know we have Norman, we can see you, and we can see Claire Lavery has dialed in. We can't see her face, but she knows she's with us. And we also have Stephen Matthews. Yep. Okay, well, we're getting there. So, Norman, are you going to start off the briefing for us? Hold on, you're not. We haven't got your signed yet, Norman. Just wait. Can we bring Norman Sturrett in? Norman, can you check that you haven't muted your, yourself where you are? Uh, I oh, think we, can hear you now. Yeah. we can hear you now, Norman. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair, and, uh, and members of the, the uh, Communities Committee for, for uh, meeting with us today to allow us to raise the issues of uh, future funding for disability employment services and also to highlight the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the job seekers that, that we serve. Uh, the, the lineup today is a little bit different, Chair, just than, than, than we had, unfortunately, a, a member taken ill and we had to make a substitution at the last minute. Uh, I have with me today uh, Claire Lowry, the Northern Ireland Director for Action on Hearing Loss, uh, Stephen Matthews, the Chief Executive of the Cedar Foundation, uh, and joining Stephen, his colleague, Elaine Armstrong, who is the Director of Employability and Community Inclusion with Cedar, uh, and myself, uh, Norman Sterrett, the uh, Progression to Employment Service Manager with Triangle Housing Association, uh, and also Chair of the Northern Ireland Union of Support and Employment. Um, if I may, I'd like to, to, to provide the committee with a, with a brief overview and a little bit of background to, to the Northern Ireland Union Support and Employment uh, and, uh, and some of the key issues for the disability employment sector, both prior to the pandemic and, uh, and subsequently the, the, uh, the impact following COVID-19. Uh, the Northern Ireland Union of Supported Employment um, uh, is an umbrella organisation representing individuals and organisations um, providing employment opportunities for disabled people and people from other disadvantaged situations. And NIUS promotes the model of supported employment as an employment intervention which assists people um, with disabilities to access, stay and progress in employment uh, by providing person-centred uh, support and ongoing support to both the participants uh, and employers. Uh, support of employment is an internationally recognised model which has been delivered across Northern Ireland over the last 25 years. Uh, the model, model has also been recognised in the Northern Ireland Employment Strategy for People with Disabilities that was launched back in, in March of 2016 uh, by the then Dell Minister, Dr Stephen Farry. Uh, the strategy recognises support employment as the preferred employment intervention uh, for disabled people to, to ensure that they can access, stay uh, and progress uh, in their employment. 
The main source of funding for disability employment services in recent years has been the European Social Program, European Social Fund Program, which is administered through the Department for the Economy. Uh, the strategic aim of the ESF program in Northern Ireland is to combat, combat poverty and enhance social inclusion by reducing economic inactivity uh, and also to increase the skills base of those currently in, in work and future potential participants in work. And it provides a vital funding for long-term unemployed, uh, for ex-offenders, uh, for the needs groups, uh, and for disabled people. Uh, the ESF program provides a, a, a vital uh, a funding lifeline to support those furthest from the labour market to enable their progression into employment, training, and, uh, and, and education as well. Uh, there are currently 22 ESF-funded projects under the ESF disability theme. And the makeup of this funding is 55% uh, from ESF, 10% from the Department of Economy, and the remaining 35% uh, from a range of match funding organizations, typically government departments, uh, health, social care trusts, um, councils, uh, further and higher education, and other pri private sector sources. Indeed, the Department for the Communities themselves match fund 13 of these 22 disability-focused projects with, with the level of funding ranging from the from from one percent right up to the 35 percent match fund component uh, this provides a significant contribution of almost 1.4 million pounds per annum uh, over the four year uh, every year for over the four years of the current esf program esf funding comes to an end in march 2022 However, the UK government is committed to keep in place current ESF arrangements until they expire in, in 22, uh, and then to create a successor fund. The proposed new UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which operates across the UK, we are told will serve a similar purpose to the existing uh, ESF uh, funding and the European Structural Investment Funds. Uh, the Scottish Government have consulted widely uh, with stakeholders and launched a report on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the Welsh Government are currently consulting. However, we're, we're not quite clear where we are in Northern Ireland in regards to, to, to that consultation process. Uh, 16 of our, of our now used members have come together to, to set up a policy group to highlight the impact of the end of ESF, ESF programmes and to seek clarity on the new funding arrangements for the UK Shared Prosperity Fund or alternative funding mechanisms. The, uh, this now used policy group produced a briefing paper entitled Future Funding for Disability Employment Services back in June of last year, uh, which identified key concerns and actions. The now used policy group, policy group has met uh, and raised uh, their concerns with officials across a number of government departments with economy, communities, health and finance. Uh, the issues, of course, have become further compounded by the, by the COVID-19 and, and the uncertainty of the future, both socially and economically. Uh, and we've come to the Communities Committee today as a matter of urgency uh, to, to, to raise these issues and, and to urge action. Um, the ESF programme funding round is, is just past its halfway mark, um, and the results really have been very positive. Uh, to date, uh, 6,635 6, disabled people have benefited across the 22 organisations that provide services. Um, and, and the outcome has been quite good, about 17.5%, that's you know, 1,162 have progressed onto, onto play employment. Uh, and this, this figure sort of significantly exceeds the 10% target that uh, ESF uh, set at the onset uh, by a considerable amount. One thing, finding a job and getting somebody into a job, it's another thing, keeping the, keeping the job, of course, but uh, this programme has delivered 54% of those uh, participants uh, to remain in their paid employment uh, six months after they've left the programme. Uh, so it's quite a strong retention rate. 17.8% uh, um, progress into training and education upon leaving the, the programme. So even though a job may not have been found for somebody, you know, almost 18% of them have found their way into further training and education to, to continue their, their employment journey. 
So the projects uh, have to date uh, performed very well uh, and they're on target to achieve and in many cases succeed uh, and surpass the, the, the final outcome targets that were set. Uh, the ESF programme has transformed disabled people's lives by improving their skills and employ uh, employment opportunities as well as promoting independence and social inclusion and building confidence and, and the overall well-being of, of participants. However, COVID-19 has impacted greatly on the lives of people with disabilities. Um, disabled people are at risk of, of poor social, economic and health outcomes. Uh, they're much more likely to experience isolation and loneliness and uh, uh, it impacts obviously on their mental health, particularly through this, this pandemic time we're, we're experiencing. Uh, employment for this group of citizens is essential in promoting that independence and social inclusion. Um, and disabled people face significant barriers in securing employment, uh, not just during this COVID, but we've known this all along. Uh, they're more likely than non-disabled people to have no qualifications um, and to be unemployed uh, and, uh, and any economically inactive. Um, and this is a key issue in Northern Ireland where, where the proportion of working age disabled people uh, in employment is only 35%. Uh, that's much lower than in the rest of the UK at around 45 to 50 percent and of course all this was before COVID-19 um, so you know it's compounded even further. COVID-19 is very likely to have a, a disproportionate effect on disabled people. People with a disability are more likely to need, need to shield or self-isolate uh, and not just during this current lockdown but while we, we sort of live with this virus uh, and it remains present. Many disabled people are also employed in the hospitality and retail sector. Of course, we, we know that they've been the worst affected uh, sectors in the economy. Uh, and it's important to consider that compared to non-disabled people, those with a disability are twice as likely to remain unemployed when they fall out of work uh, for an extended period of time. So there's some positives, of course. On a positive note, uh, people with disabilities who, who didn't have to shield or isolate during this, uh, this recent uh, lockdown uh, continued to be employed throughout the lockdown and, uh, and supported uh, by, by ESF projects to do that. Um, and, and as more employment sectors open, disabled people are finding their way back into, uh, in, into the workplace uh, supported by the ESF pro projects. However, as we're aware, um, there are many more employment casualties um, and there's likely to be, uh, as, we, as we come through recovery, um, more people will be made run, uh, redundant and uh, sadly, you know, become, become unemployed. So we're, we're, we're tough times ahead of us. Um, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the, 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 the Department of Communities and the Department of Economy and, and the other match funders during this very difficult time that we've all experienced. Uh, you know, they've kept, they've kept the wheels on, they've kept the funding coming, um, and, and that's allowed organisations to, to, to continue to engage and support uh, their participants. And, uh, you know, quite often we find new creative ways to do that. Disabled people desperately need uh, the support to continue so that they can play their active role uh, as we move outside of, the, outside of this current lockdown and into recovery. So the little paper we, we provided the, the committee with there had six key asks. And I'd just like to sort of touch on those before, before we sort of open up uh, for, for, for further discussion and questions. Um, I suppose the first ask is, is really a, a strategy and an action plan. Uh, to support disabled people into training and employment following the labour market disruption due to this COVID. Um, you know, there'll be loads of, of, of initiatives and ideas uh, coming forward. Disabled people shouldn't be left behind in, in all these new uh, ideas. Um, we're looking for clarification, uh, fairly urgent clarification on the future funding arrangements uh, for disability employment projects that are currently delivered through ESF. Uh, with an assurance that there will be no gap uh, between existing and, and, and new funding streams that might come on board. Um, one of the things that we're proposing is an agreed uh, necessary transition period, which will see the current ESF programmes and the delivery mechanisms that underpin them uh, be extended for a minimum of three years to buy us a little bit of time during this very difficult period. Um, too much time has elapsed to develop a suitable replacement before the end of March 2022, 
and with, with COVID uh, likely to present significant challenges to the labour market for the foreseeable future, um, you know, continued with a tried and tested programme would ensure that some stability for disabled people in terms of accessing training and, and, uh, and their employment support continues. Um, the, the, the fourth ask would be uh, powers really to, to allocate funding through the UK Shared Prosperity Fund need to represent Northern Ireland's default status and responsibilities for social inclusion and economic development. Uh, we'd also uh, you know, like to advocate to ensure that, that the new funding at least matches the current ESF total resources and that this is future-proofed for inflation. Disabled people last day, but very much these days are, are the core of all our, our focus. Uh, they should be consulted on the priorities to be supported through the UK Shared Prosperity Fund or alternative means uh, rather than come late to the game and, and, and present something that uh, maybe doesn't meet their needs so that they're key to it all. Thank you very much, Chair, for this opportunity and we look forward to, to your questions. Okay, thank you, Norman, for that briefing. Before I start asking questions, can I just, Elaine, you're not in um, the room with us at the minute, we can see you there. So I just need to ask our techie people behind the scenes if they can include you. Yep, you're there now. That's okay. So, uh, Norman, just for continue, um, yeah, just say thank you. Thank you for coming and briefing the committee. Um, it, it, it is a sad, sad state of affairs whenever we're still at the stage where people with a disability do not have a quality of opportunity when it comes to the labour force. And I most certainly do understand that you said it in your first line that you are a lifeline. Um, to many of those individuals um, and uh, to enable them and encourage them to get into the labour market. So, so I only have a few short questions and I suppose it's around the future planning of this and I know, I know you said in your paper um, that this could take typically three to five years to develop a new scheme of some sort and we don't have three to five years. So I suppose it's just to ask um, what engagement you have had both with the Department of the Economy and the Department of Communities um, here in Northern Ireland and also um, what input any of your uh, partner organisations or, or likewise organisations have had um, over at Westminster into the input of the successor scheme um, as well, if you could uh, maybe answer those. Sure, absolutely. Actually, if you don't mind, maybe I'll pass to one of my colleagues. Um, Stephen, are you able to hear us and pick it up? Yes, Norman, uh, uh, certainly. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, um, uh, for, for the opportunity to uh, present and, and uh, many members. Um, um, I, I would say, yeah, um, in recent times, we've had a, a positive engagement with the Department for the Economy through the committee uh, structure, and the Minister has responded um, by saying that uh, they're very much committed to look at the um, sustainability of services that are focusing on the social and economic inclusion of people with disabilities. So, and we understand that there's been a high level engagement between um, the Department of Communities and the Department of the Economy um, to start to progress that. Um, so I think um, that's a very positive outcome and we would ask the, the committee really to encourage that ongoing engagement. But I think the concern that we have is really, as uh, Norman had, had outlined, is that uh, we're running very, very um, at, a, at, a, at a time whenever um, uh, our capacity and, um, and the demand on our services is likely to increase. Um, and really one of the key asks that we're really saying is we're looking to sustain um, a very effective service um, that has been demonstrated not just across Northern Ireland, but across the UK and across Europe, as one of the most effective utilisations of European funding, um, has stood to independent scrutiny by both the Commission um, and in, turn, in terms of internal evaluation here in Northern Ireland. So, I mean, the, the issue is really the demand uh, and the time constraints, and that we're really asking for um, the two committees, um, uh, the two departments to work uh, together alongside other, other departments, particularly the Department of Health, to have an agreed approach to the sustainability of this work at a time of increased concern. So that, that, that's really <coughs> our, principal, our principal ask in many, in many ways, Chair. Um, but I think you know, we stand by the effectiveness of, of our actions. Um, and as Norman uh, was, was, was saying, I mean, we have met and exceeded all of our targets in the two years of the current programme. And in CEDARS' case alone, um, 
and we, we provide um, a range of services for people with disability, autism and brain injury. Um, I mean, the, the, the target for the first two, two years, um, uh, or for the first for the four years of the programme was 1,560 people that we would work with. And within two years, we had worked with, with 1,026. So even before the COVID really has hit us full on, outstripped really what we had originally uh, all service. So we're really asking for the committee's support to look at an interim sustainability of infrastructure really effective uh, is representative of the needs of people with disabilities so that we can have time and space to put in place alternative to, to the European programmes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. We, we lost you in a few wee points there, but we, we, we picked up the majority of the gist of what you were trying to say there. Um, just to follow on from that then, um, uh, just then when it comes to designing something here um, for the UK or for, for us in Northern Ireland, specifically for us in Northern Ireland, um, can, do you think that the work can be done, you know, if the, if the, the two departments work together? To try and bring about something that that is that is worthwhile and and that uh, I mean I am a great believer in um, social contracts and and having all of those things put in place for all employers, no matter whether they're from the public sector, the private sector, or whatever else that might that might come from. Um, but and if if we did have good robust um, uh, policies in place, then there would be room for everyone and employment for everyone um, from from uh, which, whichever sector you might come from. But there would still be a need for yourselves because that support is still required there. So do you think then um, here in Northern Ireland, we could have something that was actually best poke and, and worthwhile? And I, note, I noted from some of your comments that you had said because of the nature of the funding coming from the EU, it was heavily bureaucratic. Um, so if we had something that was was Northern Ireland, uh, you know, that was that we that was brought about by our departments here, um, do you see that we could do something better, even better than what you have before? Well, bureaucracy follow, follows follows most uh, most schemes, of course. I, I suppose the key thing that that, that Stephen, the, the key point that Stephen was making was that. You know, it's taken quite some considerable time to get the current mechanism that we've got in place, uh, and given the very tight time frame we have, uh, very difficult to rush a, a complete new system, new infrastructure, new mechanisms. Um, I have to say, really, that uh, you know, we, 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 we've been quite some time building the current system in Northern Ireland, uh, and whilst it's bureaucratic, yes, everything is. Um, it works. Uh, it's, it demonstrates that it has been working. It's been working very well, uh, and, and really, we would caution against a very rapid throwing everything out that we've already got uh, and starting again with a new system. Um, you know, we really do feel that we need that two or three year bre uh, breathing space to, to to appropriately sit down, co-design and co-commission appropriate services that works for Northern Ireland. Okay, so we want to build on the system that we have. And make it as best as we possibly can. Okay. Look, I'm going to, I'm going, I'm going to open up. I'm going to open sorry. up to members. Norman, sorry, I'm going to open up to members here. Um, I know Hi. at the minute I have Kelly. Anybody else can they please let me know if they want to speak? Kelly, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that there's six and a half thousand people, isn't it, across Northern Ireland are availing of the services. Um, one of the things that really concerns me is while in Northern Ireland we can do quite a lot of work cross-departmental to ensure that um, access to employment is provided, if the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is not developed in time, we could see a break because there isn't the money there for it. Um, has the Department of the Economy um, spoken to you guys about their discussions with Westminster on that Shared Prosperity Fund and when the consultation will even start on that one? We're not terribly clear, just Kelly, uh, exactly when when that consultation will will formally start. Uh, we we understand that the you know at a strategic level, the two key departments are, are beginning that discussion, um, but not not quite aware of, of where we are in, in that, that sort of timeline. 
Um, just, I would, I would like to ask something else. Um, the current programme is fantastic, and I know that there are so many people who benefit from it. And I'm not just talking about the participants; I'm talking about the businesses um, that are involved in providing the jobs. But I think, just given my background, there's a lot across the whole of government that has me very concerned. For instance, where's DFI with provision of transport for these people? Because quite a lot of them will not be driving and will need access to public transport. Um, we need support for employers to ensure that they have an inclusive workspace. Um, we need direct support for the person. How is that going to be paid? So that's through communities and benefits. It's, um, it's direct support for organisations like yourselves. Um, what Even going back, CBI had mentioned that they needed schools to start to reflect on the type of qualifications that they were giving to people so that they, when they come out of school, they were ready for the workforce. I don't think there's been any discussion as to the type of qualifications that people with disabilities require for them to be able to go into a workplace. And as you said at the start of your presentation, um, Norman, an awful lot of people with disabilities are coming out of schools with no qualifications because it's only the GCSE type format that's being offered. Um, I'm just wondering, it is a cross-departmental issue. Um, has your group been able to um, you know, speak to all of those departments about that, or is it just with the communities and economy at the moment? Uh, yes, at the, at the moment it is, but we do have plans to, to speak to, to sort of health as well, who, who are, are you know quite often a core match funder to, to an awful lot of the programmes. Um, and, and because we're dealing with people with disabilities, obviously they've got a, a, a vested interest. So yes, uh, they are. It's so difficult, I, I guess, trying to get that cross-departmental approach um, it's it's often it's often a challenge, you know. People with disabilities aren't one aren't one grouping. They're they're members of society in the same way as we all are. Um, there isn't a, a core training program that you give to people with disabilities, uh, and then all of a sudden that, that addresses their their employment issues. Um, uh, you know the, the the model that we we all sort of operate the, of support employment looks about. You know, placing the individual first of all in the workplace, then looking at what their training needs are, and then making sure that there's adequate support around there to to, to, to deliver for both the employer and the individual. Um, so rather than putting the training up front, we put it in the middle, uh, and that way we get that early engagement with the employers. We get the buy-in, we get to meet their needs, to understand their needs, and to make that match uh, between job seeker and employer. Uh, and making sure that we, we adequately support both parties. So it's quite a complicated uh, issue. There's a whole lot of, of stuff around the edges, around access and transport and, and, and all sorts of things that, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of departments that, that, that need to work, uh, work together to make all these things happen. Um, uh, the answers in the uh, I guess it's very difficult to answer, to, to answer uh, that, 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 such a wide uh, such a wide question. And to be honest, Chair, I, I, I'd uh, uh, ask my, my, my colleague Elian Armstrong has a lot of experience in, in the design of these programmes, particularly in around meeting the needs of employers and the particular qualifications issues. Um, she would probably be in a, in, a, in a position to answer some of the, the points that Kelly also touched on. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to maybe add to that, um, I think one of the real benefits of the like of the programs that are funded ES, under ESF is that they're not just about Department of Economy goals. You know, the people we work with, we've got really clever and really good at how we draw in resources from health, resources from communities. We link in with transport providers. We're really good. We're well placed in community voluntary sector to understand the wider issues, to be very holistic in our approach. So whilst we use money from lots of different departments, we're really good at bringing that as a holistic package to what disabled people need. And I think that's why we're particularly interested to hear how departments will work together with us when they're designing a response to the fallout of COVID on that disproportionate impact for people with disabilities. Um, you know, we have a lot of the answers in the programmes we have already, um, and, and we're keen that new solutions don't duplicate some of what we already have there that's really good at being a cross-departmental response 
to the people on the ground. So that, that's probably, um, you know, part of the answer is that the community voluntary sector are good at being cross-departmental in their response. Um, finally, just one of the questions that I have is, the terrible thing happens and we don't have a UK shared prosperity fund in time. Have you guys worked out yet? You obviously know your social return on investment at the moment um, of how important this is, but what would be the financial cost to Northern Ireland as a whole if this wasn't provided? And I'm not just talking about the cost to the individual beneficiaries. I'm talking about, you know, if those people were not working, it affects families, it affects the economy, the workers of that. It will increase the number of people on benefits, which is particularly important for communities. Um, I'm just wondering, have you guys worked out that cost yet to replace, to not have the European Social Fund projects? How much would it cost Northern Ireland? Or, you know, if they even change that model, how much is it going to cost Northern Ireland to replace? Um, I think uh, well, uh, there, the Department of Economy is, is, is involved in a high level evaluation of the impact of the programme across the piece. I mean, one of the difficulties um, in, 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 in recent times is that they re removed um, the opportunity to include evaluative uh, costs into um, the, the bids. So individual projects um, uh, um, very rarely have any particular um, access to funding to demonstrate that, unfortunately, uh, Kelly. Um, but the, the, there is a high-level re review underway uh, through the Department of Economy in terms of the evaluation of the, of the programme. And I would say, in, in broad sense, we, we are very content that, um, uh, that the effectiveness and the impact of the programme has clearly been demonstrated. Um, it, a lot of us um, have our own internal impact reporting as opposed but it's not really it's really that internal review as opposed to any independent um, evaluation uh, because of the nature of the funding structure within ESF but uh, certainly um, the impact is, is there to be seen in terms of the returns that we've been making to the respective departments so if, just finally then just as you mentioned it there then so if the future UK shared prosperity fund came forward that we would be encouraging it to include an evaluation section that would enable people to to count basically and to show the value of your your product yeah that, that would be an excellent opportunity we'd certainly because uh, mm -hmm. i mean certainly one of the experiences that we have had in terms of the delivery of these programs over the last number of years is the the experience that they are iterative uh, processes i mean how we deliver and how we have responded to the social and economic circumstances today are different from the way we did things four or five years ago, looking at the infrastructure, the demands from the economy, individual circumstances. So, um, and I think that's really why we are in a very good place today, because of collectively, in terms of the work of the Northern Ireland Union of Support and Employment, we've, we've worked together to evolve and to develop our methodology. And if I could just make one, one final point, um, I think one of the most important things to bear in mind is we have an, an, an amazing infrastructure in terms of skills and expertise across the organisations from Triangle, Action Mental Health, Disability Action, Action on Hearing Loss, the skills and competence in that and the specialisms that we have um, that have been developed um, are particularly at risk so that um, if we do not get something in place then we run the real risk of an attrition and a loss of that expertise and then the impact that that will ultimately have on people with disability. Um, we feel very strongly that now is the time to, 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 to respond, uh, to get something in place in advance of the end of the European programmes. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Kelly. Um, Sinead? Yeah, listen, Sir, Kelly's asked, asked my question. Um, and I just have to say, like, I'm amazed that you still don't have clarity around the e the ESF funding. I mean, so close to the, the cliff edge that Brexit is here, and there's still no clarity. And I suppose this is just another example of the, you know, of the collateral damage that, that Brexit's leaving um, in its wake. You know, and, you know, I would suggest maybe that this, I, I know that you said that the Minister, the Economy Minister is, um, is currently looking at this and working with our counterparts, but you know, I, I would suggest that we write to the Secretary of State on this and, and ask for for urgent clarity because clearly the sector needs it um, to plan to plan ahead. So, you know, I, I would want to see clarity on it, and uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, you guys would as well. So that would be my proposal that we that we write directly to the Secretary of State, put it on his radar, and ask for clarity on it. Okay. Yeah, very helpful. Okay, we can do that, at Robin. 
Uh, <laughs> my question has been answered as well, Chair, but I don't disagree with the previous comments. And you might actually want to uh, lobby your MPs uh, as well on the matter. But I, I have, I really just I have some great respect for the work that you do. I've had the opportunity to work in association with uh, some of you in the past. Um, and uh, whatever I think the committee would do in support of you, I think we'd be willing to do so. Okay. Look, um, okay, there's no other member who has indicated that they want to ask any further questions. I suppose then as a committee, just to say to you then, um, I mean, we've, Sinead has put a proposal there um, that we do write to the Secretary of State on this very issue and I think then also we need to be writing to the various ministers and actually the executive because I know education is also probably involved here with the post-19 um, as well. So and I, I will also, I don't know whether it's the place for it or not, but I'm going to maybe ask if we can write to the chair of the, the chairperson's liaison group because Chairperson's Liaison Group brings together various issues that are cross-cutting across all departments. So it's maybe just to put that on the radar as well, a Chairperson's Liaison Group. Um, it, he may, it, it may be the appropriate place or it may not, but we can certainly ask, um, because I, I think it's something that we, we really do need to um, be making a bit of noise about. We can't let this slip in any way. We can't, we can't allow this to, to, to go by the wayside, um, given the, the invaluable work that you do. So, um, with with that, are members in agreement with those actions? I going to suggest, Chair, you might want to write to the minister dealing with it at Westminster. Yeah, yeah, we could. Is. Yes, yeah, yeah, right to to the minister at Westminster as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, and just ask what their their future proposals are. Um, so, yeah, we'll do that also. So, look, can I say a big thank you for coming along and briefing the committee today? <clears throat> And um, hopefully we'll, um, we'll 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 not let we'll not lose sight of this one either. This is another one that I think we want to keep on our radar um, as well. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay, members, happy enough with those proposals? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then can we move on then to agenda item number seven, which is the committee report on LC on the LCM on the. Immigration and Social Security Bill. Um, members, you'll find the draft report at page 58 of your meeting packs. Uh, we're going to go through the draft report section by section. Um, this is the formal consideration before the report is ordered to be printed. So can I refer members then to the section of the report on powers and membership at paragraphs 1 to 3? Can I ask our members content with paragraphs 1 to 3? Yes. Content? Yeah. Okay, I'll take it as in content unless I hear anybody shout otherwise. Um, can I then refer members to the background section of the report at paragraphs 4 to 11? And can I ask our members content with paragraphs 4 to 11? Yep, content? Yeah. Okay, then can I then refer members to part 2 of the bill, Social Security Coordination at paragraphs 12 to 20. Can I ask your members content with paragraphs 12 to 20? Yeah. Yep, content. Then can I ask members to look at the amendments to the bill at paragraphs 21 to 25? Are members content with paragraphs 21 to 25? Can I just ask, do we know um, the Scottish Government decided not to proceed? Um, can we get the detail maybe on that? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you the detail. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll get some information now, but it's generally, they're not included in the bill anymore. Yeah. So they are, are not right about. So in short, they will not be afforded the same powers as the Northern Ireland Assembly. Yeah. But that's it. But yeah, I'll read back with any more detail. Like. Just it would be good to know why they went against it. Yeah. Okay. No, we can get that information, but um, it, I, I suppose I'm just going to ask the question again. Are members content with paragraphs 21 to 25? Yep, content. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> then can I refer members um, to the committee consideration of the bill and legislative consent motion at paragraphs 26 to 47? Um, can I ask our members content with paragraphs 26 to 47? Yep, all agreed. Can I then refer members to appendix one of the report? Are members content with appendix one of the report? Yeah. Content. Yep. Then can I refer members to Appendix 2 of the report? Are members content with Appendix 2? 
Yep, okay. I'll move on then to Appendix 3 of the report. Can I then ask members, are you content with Appendix 3 of the report? Content? Sorry, whereabouts is that page? What number is that one? Appendix 3 of the report is at... Right, one second. One second, Kelly. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, members. Just testing you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I was looking through it there. <laughs> okay, members, it. are we content with Appendix 3 of the report? Content? Yes. Yeah. Okay, then, can I ask members, are they content then with Appendix 4 of the report? Are members content with Appendix 4? You'd have to be. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, members, that concludes the committee consideration of the report. And then I then need to put the question to yourselves that the Committee for Communities orders the report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum on the Immigration and Social Security Coordination Bill, NIA 35-17-22, to be printed. Members, agreed? Can I just say, um, just Are, before we agree completely... Okay. There, I get why this bill, why Northern Ireland needs to come into it, because there isn't a facility for us to do this on our own. But there's some of this that I know has already been raised in Westminster. It raises concerns. Um, but the security, social security side of this is quite key for us. The immigration stuff is concerning. But it's just to raise that as, as you know, we see this. If there's any further amendments made to this in Westminster, we will need to see them. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. If there's a paragraph in the report with this committee has requested any, that, any additional any further updates and they will be asked the yeah. department to update yeah that's in the report okay members can i just then ask are you content then that this be that this is this be printed then i read it in earlier yes okay all right then we're going to move on to agenda item number eight which um, sorry go ahead um, mark mark did you want to say something no okay okay Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, just to remind members, everybody's back on the room, in the room for this part now, I think, aren't they? We can hear everybody now, so just remind you all of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Agenda item number eight then is SR 2020-120, the Local Government Accounts and Audit Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Members, you'll find a copy of the rule at page 97 of your meeting packs. Can I ask members, have they any objections to the rule? No objections? No. Okay, then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-120, the Local Government Accounts and Audit, Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objections to the rule. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item. Sorry. Has Johnny dropped off? Oh, don't no, know where he's gone. No, he's, 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 he's on his phone. Sorry, he's on. Oh, he's back in. There he is. Okay. Agenda item number nine, then, members, is SR 2020-129, the Universal Credit Great Britain Reciprocal Arrangements Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. You'll find this rule at page 105 of your meeting packs. Can I ask members, have they any objections to this rule? No, no objections? Okay. No. Okay, can then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-129, the Universal Credit Great Britain Reciprocal Arrangements Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objections to the rule. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item number 10, which is correspondence. You'll find the correspondence memo at page 117 of your meeting pack. And can I just highlight that uh, Belfast Chamber has provided a report at page 130 on building Belfast back better. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. And have asked to brief the committee on it at some stage in the future. Um, are, are members content that we consider this and other requests that we have received at a meeting in early September when we consider our forward work program in the context of departmental priorities? Yes. Okay. Members also correspondence and tabled items on page 13 from the department relating to regulations being made by DWP on statutory sick pay, 
that will also apply here. It means that people here will benefit from these changes at the same time as everyone else in the UK um, when they come into operation on the 6th of July. So can I then ask members, have they, are they uh, content um, to agree uh, to the correspondence memo? Agreed. Everybody okay with that? Yes? All right. Then we'll move on then to agenda item number 11, not correct? Yep. Which is forward work programme. Uh, members, it's my intention, um, unless something urgent comes up, and it may well come up over the next few weeks, um, if the committee have to meet up again, but it's my intention that this should will be our last one before the Assembly officially goes into summer recess. Um, so, um, But as I say, if something comes up, well, certainly we can, the committee can come back at any time over summer recess um, and the, if there's something urgent. So uh, after recess, then we'll consider our forward work programme for the new term. Um, and uh, it says here we'll be likely to be very busy. Of course, we will. We've got the pensions bill, we've got um, the uh, liquor licensing, and then also the possibility of the gambling as well, the gambling bill as well. So we're going to have a busy time of it. Um, whenever we do come back, we're going to hit the ground running. So um, I just ask members, have they any comments? Are they content to note that what I've said about the forward work programme? <coughs> Happy enough? Sorry, just, Sinead? No, just to say to her, like, it's been a busy first term, and just to say well done to your staff on, on keeping keeping a handle on, on all of us and all of it. So no, we'll look forward to, to getting struck back in when we return. I think we've all worked pretty well together, so we have. And to the clerks and the officials. Yeah, yeah especially to the clerks. We've managed most of it. Yeah, so thank you, members, for that. Um, I'll move on then to agenda item 12, which is AOB. Can I ask many members that have any other business that they want to bring up at this stage? I was just going to say, can we maybe plan for one of our first meetings to be our forward work? You know, the, we, we didn't have our away day or whatever it's That's called. That's exactly what we're doing. Kevin and I have discussed it already. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think that would be a good idea that if, before we hold it, uh, or maybe... Uh, but well, hopefully the minister will respond, but she, not hopefully she will respond with what her priorities are. And once we know what her priorities are, then we can look at the priorities for the committee. Um, so that would be the hope that we would have. Uh, it'll not be an away day. It'll be some other form um, of of us getting together to discuss our forward work program. So yeah, a that's absolutely. Sorry. A virtual, virtual away, away day. day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You can all choose where we'd like to be and go there and hold a meeting <laughs> in all different places. Okay, members. So if there's no other business, there, I'll move then on directly to agenda item 13, which is date, time, and location of next meeting, and that has yet to be confirmed. So thank you very much, members. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.